All right, today we're going to talk about not letting the devil mess with your thoughts. Okay, not letting the devil mess with your mind. You know, in the Bible, if you read the Bible cover to cover, we don't talk a lot about the devil, right? If you look at the Bible, there's so many more verses which talk about God's promises and prosperity. They talk about things like confrontation. They talk about things, the Bible talks about things like battles, but really putting the finger on the devil, we don't do that a lot in the Bible. And there's a reason for that, I find, spiritually. And that is God wants to talk about all of the good stuff he has for you, so he keeps you in the right frame of mind. But what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about actually fighting the devil. I'm going to talk about what the devil tries to do to you to mess up your life. Because we've got to get the tools in place to handle this. So my name is Greg Ward. As you know, I, I come here to Alpha and Omega Church. I preach from time to time. I also am a lawyer. I handle car accident cases. So in my job, I see confrontation with the devil every day. Now, what do you mean by that, Greg? So the devil is going to create situations that's going to cause you to question your faith. And I see it in my business because people get hurt in a car crash or something else happens where they get some problem in their life. And it's not just one or two problems. It could be three or four or five or six. And when you've got six problems and then you get hurt, you've got a whole other world of problems, right? So I see this constantly in my business. I see spiritual warfare all the time. And people actually, as a lawyer, they come to me as an intercessor to deal with these problems. So I consider myself a little bit, I don't want to say an expert, because it's really through God that I get revelation. But the truth is, I have to deal with these issues every single day. And I see people at their worst. So I see these confrontations in the spiritual world, which show up in the real world. Okay, that's my background for this. And so I see it every day. So I see the tricks the devil uses to get inside our heads, all right? And we don't like to talk about them because we already beat them as Christians. We beat the devil. Now, just by show of hands, who's new here? Who's brand new? First time, first time in church. You're here for a reason. You're here for a reason. You're here for a reason. God brought you here for a reason. There's something special for you here today that you haven't gotten before, okay? You're here to, see, to receive this for some reason. I don't know what you're going through in your personal life. Everything I share is going to be things that I have been through or people in my family have been through, so I don't want you to think there's any judgment here either, okay? We all have these challenges. Pastor puts me up here because he knows I've been through these challenges, and I still struggle with these challenges. I'll give you an example from my personal life in just a second. But you people who are here for the first time, you're here to receive something. And I don't know if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet. We'll talk about that at the end and give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as your Savior because to work through all of this you need to accept Jesus as your personal savior. Okay, for all of this to work, for the devil to be defeated in your life, you need to have Jesus as your savior. But let me get back to a personal challenge that I had. So I'm always waiting on the spirit, right? In my, in my business, in my, in my spiritual life, I'm always waiting for the spirit to descend and fill me, okay? Who here has been filled with the spirit? Who knows what that feels like? Oh, amen, praise God, give yourselves a hand. That's amazing, that's amazing. And so, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes I talk and I don't have the spirit in me. I'll be honest, it happens, right? If I'm not connected with God, it just happens and I just go and do the best I can do and, and maybe someone will receive part of the message. But the best message is when the spirit is in me, okay? And this is when I go to court too. I go and I say, you know, God, fill me with the spirit. Use me as your vessel. Whatever you have to say here, I claim this courtroom in the name of Jesus Christ. I surrender to you. Do what you will, okay? So I want to be filled with the spirit, and so today I'm coming, and my wife is excited about this. I, I talked to another church about this message in Orlando, and it was amazing. It was a great, great topic. And so she's hungry for that. She felt the Spirit. She wants it again, right? So she wants me to be as good as I was then and, and have the Spirit. So, and, of course, that puts pressure on me, my flesh, right? I'm like, oh, i got to bring it now, you know? She even said to me after the church, she's like, why don't you pray like that in our, in our home? And I'm like, oh, man, I thought I did. I don't know, you know? I, I, th I, I don't know. I don't know. It's the Spirit. He fills me, you know? It, it goes. So. Anyway, so I'm waiting on the Spirit. I'm driving down here, coming down 826, and I start praying. I'm like, God, please fill me with the Spirit. Use me as your vessel. I surrender myself to you. Use me as you will. And I felt the Spirit come on me. And I'm like, oh, there it is. I feel it right now. Oh, there he is. There he is. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And I was listening to some regular music, so I put on worship, right? I'm, I'm just, I, I flip on some, uh, I forget, it was Hillsong or something. And I feel the worship, and it's building in me, building in me, building. I'm getting excited. Spirit's coming. I'm getting more and more spiritual energy. And I look up. And on the side of the road is a billboard from one of my competitors, <laughs> right? And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm spirit-filled. And then I had had a conversation about this particular person 
with someone else and it filled my, it filled my heart with all these negative things like all oh, the bad stuff that they're doing, da 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 all this stuff. Don't try and figure out who it is because you won't know. <laughs> so, and, but I can tell you what happened. What happened? The spirit left me. Boom, just like that. The faucet got turned off. I didn't even realize it. It happened in a second. I look up, I see the billboard. I've seen the billboard a hundred times and all of a sudden the spirit's gone, gone, gone. And I'm like, oh man, no, 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 no. Come back, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I had to get my mind straight again. And so what did I do? I had to repent, right? I had to repent in that moment. And I promise you, the minute I said, God, forgive me, I repent of my sins, the spirit came back immediately, boom, just like that, just like that. And so here's the thing that the devil does, right? God wants to be in us all the time. He doesn't want us to wait on the Spirit. He wants to fill us with the Spirit all the time, right? He wants to be living in us. He does live in us if we receive Jesus as our Savior. He's living in there. We don't always feel it. When we want to always feel it, God wants to, us to feel his presence all the time. But what happens? We live in a sin-cursed world. We live in a world, Adam lost the world, when he ate the fruit, he gave up the world to the devil. The devil runs the world now. And so we claim the world back for the kingdom through Jesus, right? God is redeeming us and restoring us through his son and the sacrifice he made. But the truth is the world is a place that's infected with sin constantly. And by the way, that sin, so I see the image, I just see one image, and the sin enters my heart, right? My sin, and I don't even realize it's a sin entering my heart. I didn't even realize it at that moment, but it turned off the flow of the Spirit. And so this is me. This is my example. And I know you're going to say, Greg, okay, that's, okay, so what, right? Two minutes, whatever, you got through it. But this happens to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so what happens as Christians as we go forward, we are constantly being bombarded by images that cause us to sin, Right? It's not just looking at the sin of the world. It's looking at images that create sin in us. And so then we start thinking sinful thoughts. And so we start going down the hill away from God. Because our minds begin to think thoughts that manifest in our bodies, manifest in the world. And so then we become creatures of sin. Right? Or creatures who are in a sinful state. Now, we're redeemed through Jesus. Our sins are forgiven, but we've got to repent of those sins so we can reconnect with God. And I know this sounds heavy, and some of you new guys are like, what is he talking about? But the point of the matter is, is that we have to be very careful about the images and the, the images we're looking at and the thoughts we're allowing to creep into our heads. Okay? So, each, why? Because each of us has a mission here on this earth. Right? God has a purpose for every one of us, and our purpose is what we do on a daily basis, and we move closer to God, and the real purpose is to give him the honor and the glory. Right? Everything we have to accomplish through our weakness, as they said in the, in the hymn, through the weakness, our perfection is, or God's perfection is shown. Right? So we have a purpose, we have a mission. The devil wants to keep you off purpose and off mission as much as possible. Right? And so he's going to come at you with whatever tricks he has. And he's been around a long time. And so he's got a lot of tricks. And he's got a lot of deceptions. And he's got a lot of weapons. And most of the time, one of the biggest, you know what one of the biggest tricks the devil has? One of the biggest deceptions? We forget that he exists. How about that? You know, so I, I'm actually in the process. I'm studying for a master's degree in theology. One of the big debates now in church circles is in the, the Lord's Prayer... Deliver us from evil, or deliver us from the evil one. Right? Deliver us from the, did he say evil one, or did he say evil? Right? We all know that all evil comes from the devil. Right? God is good, he has no evil. But there is a, there is a movement afoot. What the devil's trying to do is convince us that he doesn't even exist. Right? So we turn our eye to that, so we, so we don't confront the devil where we see him. And by the way, biblically... Right? The devil, it's not, you know, it's the devil, but it's principalities. They're using people to influence us. Now, I'm going to use my daughter as an example. So my daughter get, is in the science competition, right? And she, and she got first place in this event 
It's a, a tri-county event. It's a big deal. I didn't even know what of a big deal it was. She calls me. She's all cool. She's like, Daddy, I got first place in this one event. My team got third place overall, so I'm going to the state championships in this thing, and I'm really excited about this, right? That's great. And I find out how big the competition is. I think it's a big deal. So what happens the next week? There's a scheduling conflict, and the teacher, the coach, takes my daughter off of her first place team and puts her on a different team in an event that she doesn't know anything about. And so does my daughter say, hey, you know what, this is a great challenge because through this I can show that God's glory. No, my daughter doesn't do that. She gets with her buddies and they start complaining and she gets upset about it. And so this wonderful, beautiful thing that she's going to the state championships and an opportunity to, to testify for what God has done in her life becomes, hey, that coach was manipulated by the other girl and all these girls are all, oh, and they're all crying. And then, and I thought, okay, baby, I explained it to her. I said, the coach put you on the team because you're a smart kid, she knows you can pick up the stuff, and by the way, when you get to states and you win, that's a testimony for God, right? And I thought that sunk in, but no, next week, my daughter's still complaining about it. But what's happening here, right? Oh, she's rolling her eyes now. So what's happening here? What's happening here? The beautiful, wonderful gift that God gave her, giving her the win, has been corrupted. And he's keeping her off mission so she can't prepare for the next test that she has. In this case, it's a literal test, right, the test. But in life, we've got a bunch of little tests. We're always being tested. But he's got her with the drama of her friends, right, complaining about this wonderful thing. Instead of the gift that she received, this opportunity to compete and show what God has done for her in her life, she's upset at the coach. And so she doesn't trust the coach. She doesn't trust her, the, the girl who took her place. She doesn't trust her. She's thinking she's, uh, she's upset at her. And so you get the drama, right? And I would say it's teenage drama, but that happens to all of us, right? It truly does. How many times have you been at work, you've been passed over for promotion, whatever happened, and instead of saying, you know what? There's something better for me. God has something more amazing for me. God has a bigger purpose for me. What do you say? I. she doesn't deserve it. She just got it because she wears her dress down to here or she wears a short skirt. Oh, no, that's, no, she's terrible. Oh, he, he's just, he, he, brought, he, he always takes the boss out to lunch. He just sucks up. He's such a brown noser. Oh, that's why he got that job. We do it, right? And we forget that God maybe has something better for us and the devil is tricking you. In that moment, when you switch from God is good, I'm so happy to, oh, that guy is whatever. In that minute, you flipped into sin, and the devil got you. He got you. So he's not, he's, not, he's not coming at you face to face. He's tricking you, right? He does come at us face to face sometimes. So let's go ahead to the scripture, because I want to give you an example. So Jesus, right? Now, Jesus is out in the wilderness, right? Jesus comes in. He's baptized by John the Baptist, what is significant about when Jesus was tempted and confronted the devil? What is the special part of that scripture? It's at the beginning of Jesus' ministry on earth. If the devil can get you at the beginning of something important, he can completely derail you. If he infects you at the beginning of some mission that you have, like my daughter going to the state championship, if he can get you when you begin to prepare for that mission, he got you. You're done. So when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, heaven's open. God says, this is my son, and I love him, right? We don't know much about Jesus before that moment, right? We know that when he was a young man, he was in the temple teaching the rabbis. But after that, we don't really hear much until we get to him in the river with John the Baptist, so he gets baptized. Heaven's open. This is a big deal. And what Pastor Delgado talked about last week was that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. But he had flesh. He was a real flesh person. So he had the ability for the devil to, get, to tempt him and to attack him. It's there because he's a mortal man on one hand like us, but he's perfect God on the other hand. So he has the potential to sin. So what happens? Let's go ahead and put up Matthew 4, 4, 3, 3 and 4. So Jesus then is baptized, and what does he do? He goes into the wilderness. Now, in the wilderness, I don't know if any of you have been to Israel, the wilderness, the Judean wilderness, it's a rough place, right? It's a desert, basically, right? Not like the Sahara Desert, but it's, it's pretty nasty. I mean, there's little bushes, there's locusts out there and some wild honey and things like that, but it's not, it's not like our wilderness where there's a forest. Like, there's nothing there. It's barren. So Jesus is out there 
for 40 days. You got the scripture up yet? Matthew 4, 3. There we go. So Jesus is in the desert, in the wilderness, and, he, and he's there for 40 days. 40 days. Think about that for a second. He's, he doesn't, I mean, they didn't have air conditioning back then, but he's out there for 40 days, right? Fasting, praying, and what happens? Because this is the beginning of his ministry, the devil's gonna tempt him. So the devil comes, and he knows he's hungry, right? Imagine how hungry you'd be if you didn't eat for 40 days. Now, maybe he had a couple, a couple locusts or something like that, but he's, he's not in a good spot, physically. The devil comes and says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So where does he tack them? In his flesh. Jesus is hungry. He's really hungry. And the devil tests him and says, if you're really the son of God, make this into bread. Eat. Jesus, what is he trying to do there? He's trying to get Jesus to visualize that. And Jesus could have done it, by the way, because he turned water into wine, so he has the ability of transmutation. He could have done it. He's trying, the devil's trying to get in Jesus' head, right? Because if Jesus starts to realize how hungry he is, he's going to submit to the devil, which is what Adam did. Devil wins. Wiped out. All of us. Right? Give me the next verse. So what does Jesus do? Jesus comes back with scripture, and he says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So in the moment when he's being tempted with the flesh, Jesus turns to the word. Right? He turns to scripture. And he quotes scripture back to the devil. Give me the next verse. Then the devil takes him to the holy city and he puts him up on the top of the temple. Next verse. And he says, if you're the son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, he'll command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Go ahead and get the next verse. Now, what the devil's trying to do is he's again trying to tempt Jesus. He's saying, if you're really God, prove it. What's that? That's pride. That's our pride. How about this? If you're really a Christian, prove it. If you're really that much of a believer, prove it. And what does Jesus say? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Answers with scripture again. Next verse. So then the devil, this is the big one now. He takes him to a big high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, for those of you who, who don't know this, as I said early, the devil owns the world. He's got it now because Adam ceded control back in the Garden of Eden. So he's got, the devil has control over all the cities of the world now. And he can, he can give them to Jesus, but Jesus has got to submit to the devil. Jesus isn't going to do that. Go to the next verse. No, I'm sorry. If you fall down and worship me, that's the condition. Next verse, 410. Jesus says to him, and this is where he wins, Satan, be gone. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. So he tempted Jesus with greed. How many times in your life have you been tempted to do the wrong thing because of greed? Right? That's the easy one. It's easy to say, okay, I'm just being greedy. What about the hard one where there's two choices and one is really the right way and one is the less right way? Not the amazing, perfect way, but you know what? I could, I could, I could do that. That's not going to get me in trouble. That's not going to make me lose my job. I'm not going to break the law. But you know it's not the right thing to do. It's not the real thing to do. Right? We're being tested in that moment. And on those things, there's always, what's the fleshy part of that that you're doing? Maybe it's that you don't want to confront a situation you need to confront. And so your flesh, in fear, you're afraid of the situation. And so then you go away and you take the easy path out. How many times does that happen? How many times do you know something in your life where you need to confront something? A friend, maybe an ex-wife. How many times is it you need to confront somebody they are doing something wrong and you take the easy way out? I have a relative of mine who is, he is complete, he's a Christian and he's completely flattened because his ex-wife is manipulating him through the kids. And he, won't, he just says it's easier to go this way 
than to do the right thing. He's completely immobilized. It happens, it happens to me. I get immobilized sometimes if I don't have the faith. If I don't go to the scripture, and if I don't have the faith inside of me, I take the easy way out. And then what happens? I miss my purpose. I miss my mission. I lose my mission. Jesus has demonstrated in this passage what we need to do when we're confronted by the devil. And it's not always as easy as having the devil standing in front of you, confronting you with something. Sometimes it's just the image that's on the television. Sometimes it's the image on a billboard. And if you watch the television enough, it begins to plant the soil. It begins to till the soil for the negative thoughts. And this becomes the soil where you're trying to plant your seeds. You have got to be conscious of the thoughts that are inside your head. Because those thoughts are what the devil is trying to activate to get you away from Jesus and God. What images are we showed, shown? To be happy, you've got to have the perfect car. You've got to have the perfect house. You've got to have the perfect body. This one is really bad. You've got to have the perfect body, right? And for women who see the unrealistic body images in Cosmo or sees the Kardashians or whatever, it's particularly difficult for women to deal with this. But you know what happens to men too, right? Young is in. Young is cool. God bless you young guys. You got it all, man. You got it all. Me, not so much. <laughs> but it happens, right? We become, our bodies begin to slow down. We don't have the same strength that we used to have. But we're showed these constant images of what appear to be perfection. And it's, and it's fake because they're airbrushed, right? The TV shows show fake. How about Facebook? Oh, my gosh, Facebook. It could be a great tool, right? But we use, what do we use Facebook for, right? We see, the, we see the highlights on Facebook. So you think that your friend or your enemy, whoever it is, is having this great life on Facebook and they could be dealing with the worst drug addiction or they could be dealing with a kid who's got cancer or something like that, but you only see the good stuff on Facebook. And so then you begin to get jealous. Oh, so-and-so's got this, so-and-so went there, so-and-so went to, you know, to Bali or wherever it is. And so you see these images and, they, and it begins to create sin in you. Instead of being happy for that person, you get jealous. Instead of saying, maybe that's the body I should aspire to, you say, oh, you know, she has a personal chef or whatever it is. And so we begin to feel less about ourselves. And the devil takes over up here. And when he gets one area, he does it in every area. Right? Once he gets one, all he needs is one area to get inside your head. It could be your physical appearance. It could be your finances. It could be your health. It could be any of those areas where all those areas that God has promised to you, that these are all of his promises... For your better life, if the devil can corrupt one of those areas, he's got them all. Because you know what we do as people, right? As human beings, what do we do? We focus on the one negative thing in our life, right? You could have everything going great, but you got one bad thing in your life and you focus only on that. I use my daughter for another example, right? The science thing. She goes to a great school. She's got lots of good friends. She's doing amazing, better than I ever did, way better than I ever did, but she's focusing on that one thing. And you can't get past it because you're only focused on that, that negative thing. And so what do you gotta do in that situation? It, it, it's like a cancer, it spreads. It's a mental cancer that spreads and takes over every area of your life and it overcomes and defeats all the promises that God has for you. We talked about this happening to Jesus at the beginning of his ministry because if he could have gotten Jesus at the beginning, he would have beat him his whole life. Thank God. Literally, thank God, that didn't happen. What happens when you're ready to have a major breakthrough in your life? Let's say you've done everything right. Let's say you're ready to kick that addiction. Let's say you're ready to overcome cancer. Let's say that you've got, you're ready for a financial breakthrough. What do you think's gonna happen? You think the devil's gonna let that happen easy? What do you think he's gonna do? He's gonna turn it up. Now, we've talked about this before in this church, and I'll tell you, it still gets me too. Because sometimes, I say this at work sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes you're the hammer, sometimes you're the nail, right? Feels like that, right? When you got a major breakthrough that's getting ready to come in your life, 
The devil's going to turn it up. Why? What happens when the intensity gets turned up? What happens when the sinful images get turned up? What happens when your negative thoughts start to receive those images and you begin to manifest the thoughts? You start talking about it. The power of life and death is in your tongue. Oh my gosh, I never get any breaks. This is so difficult. Oh yeah, boom, there you go. You really took yourself off track. It's always so hard. She's always gonna get the promotion. He's always gonna beat me at that deal. Good luck with that. Now, you, he won. He already beat you. Right when you were getting ready to have a major breakthrough, you see the image. It gets in your head. You start declaring it. And all of a sudden, it comes true. You lose. And that's what happens. But it happens right when you're ready to have a breakthrough. It's going to turn up. You've got to be prepared for that. If you're making a plan and it's within God's purpose for your life, you've got to be prepared for the attacks. And right at the edge of where that blessing is going to come, the devil is going to attack you right there because that's your weak spot. Because that's a spot where you see it, you're right there, you're looking at it, and you can almost taste it, and all of a sudden, you get hit on the side. You're like, what's that? You take your eye off the prize. He got you right there. Let's rewind this a little bit. When I was a kid, right, I, I, well, I was young, I got bullied a lot, a lot, right? I don't know what my, the problem was, but I just, kids picked on me. And I'm saying this because if I had believed what the bullies said about me when I was a kid, I would not have the level of success that I have now. And by the way, for you parents who see kids, or maybe their kids are incredibly rebellious, or maybe the kids are just constantly bombarded by attacks, by bullies, or maybe they're totally obsessed in video games or something else. If you've got a kid who's got a, who's got a really difficult problem, I've got a message for you. That kid is destined for something great. That kid is destined for something amazing. This is why pastor kids get attacked so much. Can you imagine the blessing and the benefit to have a pastor as a parent? There's a lot of pressure, sure, but you've got wisdom constantly coming in you. Even when you're sitting there at, at the dinner table, wisdom is flowing in your head. Now, I can appreciate it now because I'm over 40, and you know when I can spend time with Pastor Delgado, I'm going to do it because every time I spend time with him, I get something good. But when I'm 16, maybe I don't want to hear all that. right? But look at those kids. They get attacked. Why? Because they've got a purpose and a mission. There's a big point, and the devil wants to derail that kid early. Right? He wants to declare that kid early. So what do you got to do? You got to pray over your kids. You got to pray over your kids. And don't just think that if they're on the right path now, they're going to stay on the right path. Because let me tell you, maybe they're in your house and they're doing great. And all of a sudden they go away to college. You get a little alcohol, a little marijuana. All of a sudden, yeah, you know what? Maybe I was, maybe I was wound a little too tight. I'm just going to relax a little bit. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to sing worship. I'm not going to do those things. Right? So the, so, the, so the apparent perfection early then gets corrupted. They have a purpose for the kids, for your kids. God has a purpose for your children, right? He knew your children when they were in your womb. God counted the hairs. If he took the time to count the hairs, do you think he doesn't have a major purpose for every one of us? Each and every one of us has a purpose. But if the devil can get inside your head... He can derail you from that purpose. So when you're feeling the attacks, know that there's something that's getting ready to come in your life. There's a major blessing breakthrough that's coming to you right at that moment. Right at that moment. And you gotta stand firm and you gotta quote that scripture. And whatever the problem is, look up the promise of the Bible. Look up the promise of the Bible and you quote that scripture over that problem. Right? If you got a health problem, by his stripes I am healed. If you got a health problem, you quote the scripture over that. Why? Because the devil hates that. He hates when you go to the word. When you go to the word, he already knows he lost. He lost the fight back then. He's going to lose the fight now. He'll lose the fight in the future. Pray over your kids and give them the scripture so they can say the prayer. I carry these little index cards around in my pocket. I, I, I left them in the office. I wish. When I'm in court, I'm going to tell you a miracle happened in my life. Pastor prayed over me. It was the first time. When I was a baby Christian, he prays over me. He touches me. I felt this electricity flow through my body. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm like, like tingling, right? He's praying over me. I go into court. I got these scripture verses, and I see something really bad about to happen. I took out my cards. In that moment, I'm forgetting scripture. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm forgetting the, I'm forgetting the scripture, so I got to have it. I got a little card with like four verses on it. And I'm like, God, I only want your truth. 
The truth shall set you free. And I know it's the truth of Jesus, but in this moment, I just want the truth. I don't care. God, here's the scripture, 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 scripture. Boom. Miracle. Miracle. If you're looking at a guy with a gun in Jesus' name, that's all you got time for, in Jesus' name, I'm telling you there will be a physical miracle that will manifest at that moment because in the name of Jesus, all evil submits. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that's all you gotta do, in Jesus' name. Now, if you know the promise, it goes better, but in, sometimes you don't have that. You just gotta get the name Jesus. I remember my wife, she was getting ready to find out if she passed the bar or not. I couldn't even think of anything to say. I'm like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then I hear her say, yay! And I'm like, oh, praise God, you know? I'm like, because Jesus give me calm. It's the name above all names. It's just the name of Jesus. Now, it'd be great if you had 20 more promises or 20 more scriptures, but sometimes you just go to Jesus, baby. That's why he's here for us. Through his death and resurrection, he beat the devil. Everything you're looking at in your life, every battle has already been won. It's already been won. When you get in your flesh, you don't realize that, but you forget Jesus died on the cross, but you know what? The rest of the story, he resurrected. You forget that. You forget that this jerk in the, de in the desert, the devil who's trying to derail every single thing you're trying to accomplish for the glory of God, you forget that that battle already got won. It's like a kid on the playground, right? And you're, you got a big brother. You got a, you got a big brother. And you're looking at the kid who's bigger than you. You forget you got a big brother right behind you who already beat that guy up. It's already done. It's done. You don't need to worry about that. But you got to remember to turn around because your brother may not be paying attention. So you got to say, Jesus, hey, Jesus, I got the devil right here. And in your name, he's bound. You know, like that cartoon. And then Jesus gets up behind you, and that's it. Right? But your brother can't help you if you're scared of the bully because you forget you got Jesus. Your brother can't help you because the, Im the, the, the damage is that you're afraid of the bully. The problem isn't the bully beats you up. The problem is the fear the bully instills in you. Right? Because that fear is what keeps you from doing things. And I'm preaching this to you right now, and I can tell you there's areas in my life I'm afraid of things. I'm afraid too. And I gotta keep going back to Jesus. And I gotta keep going back to the word. And I gotta keep reminding myself. Because it happens to me too. And by the way, if you think, you know, let's say you got money problems right now, and you think, I got money problems. If I just had a little more money, all my problems would be solved. Nope. You, got, you get your money problems solved, guess what? You get bigger problems. Right? It's the truth. If any of you have people in your life who have money problems, or if you have money problems, I promise you, if you get more money, you're gonna get more problems. And it, by the way, everybody who won the lottery, I mean, they do studies on this stuff. People win the lottery, they end up, within five years, they're right back to where they started from. And many times they say they wish they never won the lottery. Right? So it's not the money. It truly isn't. It's your mind. And if the devil can beat you here, he got you. But we already won through Jesus. We already run through Jesus. I talked about the name of Jesus and I talked about prayers. I only got a couple more minutes. I want to give a chance to pray for some people. Um, but what else can you do to fight this fight? Okay, we talked about prayer. We talked about worship. Fasting. When you're fasting, you're causing your flesh to submit. When you... You've got to be aware of what you're thinking before you can do any of these things, though. You've got to be aware if you have a negative dialogue. And you may not know you have a negative dialogue. Like, I've got a negative dialogue that I've really worked at to overcome because of all I went through. Well, the devil kind of infected me early on. I received Jesus. I'm a Christian. But I still have a pattern in my head that I've got to overcome. And so I, my wife has a very positive dialogue. And she went through worse stuff than I went through. But she came out positive. And so I need that check. If you don't know if you have a negative or positive dialogue going on in your head, ask somebody around you. Right? Ask somebody who you think is that really happy person all the time. Ask them. Do you think I have a negative or positive dialogue? Because you may be the negative person who's bringing everybody else down. Right? You may be the person who goes to negativity. That's your pattern. Right? God can change that pattern, but you've got to be aware that there's a pattern before you start to change it. Before you pray about it, you've got to know that there's a pattern. So you've got to come into a place where you're aware of what's going on up here. And if you've got a negative dialogue, let me tell you something. The devil's got you on the ropes. You need to take control over that, and you need to pray over that. Fasting, worship, 
phrase. How often do we do this, Greg? The Bible says continually. Continually. Ephesians tells us we need to do this all the time. And the bigger your problem, the more you need to do it. Right? To overcome it. So, if you're not aware that you're the negative person, right, if you're not aware, or maybe you are aware and you're afraid to admit it to yourself, like knowing is the first, for the first step. Ask the people around you or pray to God to give you the revelation because you'll really see this manifest and I'm sure if you're a positive person, you, you know all of your negative friends. You know who they are. If you're a positive person, you may wanna keep it cool because that negative person can flip you into that negative mindset. I said that right. The positive person needs to be aware of the negative person because they can flip you into the negative mindset. They can start to show you all the downsides. If you're a negative person, be aware of that and stop declaring with your mouth. You may believe it here, but you gotta start declaring positive things. That's why the scripture's powerful. If you believe it up here, but you declare it this way with your mouth, you begin to change. Psychologists can tell you that you can rewrite the circuitry of your brain by saying positive things over your life. The last part of this, and I think this is the most important, you gotta course correct. We're like guided missiles, right? God has a purpose for us, he has a mission for us. Our purpose is how we accomplish what we're gonna do. The mission is what we're ultimately going to accomplish. You gotta course correct. And most of the time we're all like this. All of us, pastors, everybody, like this, right? We know the target's that exit sign and I'm going like this, right? But when you realize you're over here, you gotta repent. You gotta repent. I mean, I, I learned this lesson driving down 826 just today. You gotta repent. Because I felt the spirit, and I'm way over here already from one little image of a billboard on 826. I'm all the way over here. Spirit and I are disconnected. I'm, fe I'm feeling bad already. I'm starting to get angry, all this stuff. And the minute that I repented is when the spirit and I reconnected. You gotta repent. How do you repent? God, I'm sorry, I repent. That's it. If you're sorry in your heart, look at all the bad stuff that David did, King David. Look at all the bad stuff he did, but man, some of the best prayers of repentance are written by King David, because he sinned a lot, and he kept repenting, and that's why God said, you're after my heart, because he kept repenting. He would get out here, and he'd know he did something wrong, and he'd repent, and he'd write a really amazing poem about his repentance, and he'd start coming back. So we're all healed in that. We're all restored. As long as we can repent, we got a course correct, and it gets us back on path with what God has for us. It is so easy to slip into, if I can ask the worship team to come back up, it's so easy to slip into a negative mindset. We are bombarded on a daily basis by negative images that show us that we're not good enough. It happens to everybody. It happens to the pastor. You watch the news. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. If you watch the news, the world is going right to H E W L, <laughs> right? If you watch the news, why? Those are the images that you're shown on a daily basis because that's what sells, because that's what most people like to see, right? You can see the problems with our president. You can see the problems with our Congress. You can see the problems with the world government. I mean, it's easy. You get those images every day. My God, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in Asia, terrible, terrible things. And those are the images we're confronted with every single day. If you're thinking globally, in Ephesians they say we gotta think about, we gotta fight the principalities, right? We've gotta fight, you know, the, the, the rulers are influenced by demons. And we gotta fight that. So if you're thinking globally in that fight, it's easy to think we've lost, right? It's easy to think that. You watch the news, we've already lost. But it's not true, we won. We already won. We, the church, has won through Jesus. We won. Don't let the devil mess with your thoughts. Don't let him make you think that we lost. We didn't lose. We won. Jesus died on a cross. And why is that significant? A cross in the Bible is a, a, a tree. They used to hang the worst of the worst on trees. So when Paul talks about in Philippians, he talks about he was hung on a tree. 
You know, what that means is like, that's the worst punishment you could have. You know, it's like nothing like the death penalty we have today, right? That's like, you know, you want to be spit on, you want to be beat, you want to be, you know, peed on. Terrible, terrible, terrible. And he's hung on a tree, right? That's the worst of the worst. What is that image that, what is that image that the world want to project? That the son of God is on a tree, cursed. Oh, yeah. But, but what happened? He rose. He rose from the dead. And the blood that came out of him when he was hanging on the cross, it covers us. And all of our sins are forgiven. And we're redeemed. We're not creatures of sin. We're a child of God. But they don't want us to remember that because they keep showing us. I mean, the crucifix, showing Jesus hanging like this, that's not the story. That's not the story. They should show the empty tomb. The cross, the crucifix, the crucifixion is not the story. The empty tomb is the story. Because we won. He won. And we're part of him. We won. And every little negative thing in your mind, everything you're thinking, every time a friend betrays you, every time you feel hurt, every time someone you love hurts your feelings, we won. We already won. Don't let the devil use that to get you off your purpose. Do not let the infection or the division stop you from your loving and accomplishing what you're here to accomplish.